What's up everybody? The Pitt had a super interesting case of a young child who came in who was pretty much obtunded, just passed out with really altered mental status. We're going to talk through all the highlights of that case today and go over some clinical pearls that parents or the general public should be aware of. Can you wake up for me, Tyler? He's not usually this sleepy? No, and he barely flinched for the blood test. He wakes up at 90 miles an hour and doesn't stop till he passes out at night. He passes out? No, he, he just means he goes all day. Any chance he could have ingested something? Any Great first pills, question, pediatrics, vitamins, ingestion, prescriptions one, two, that may have been left around? No, that's all kept locked in the medicine cabinet. The whole house is childproof. Uh, what about alcohol? Anything left out? No. What about pets? Question. No. You say he's usually like, quite active? Very. Um, any injuries lately? No. Bumped his head recently? Not that I'm aware of, but he does love rough housing with Drew. But he never gets hurt. Oxygen level is normal, good pulse and blood pressure. So altered mental status has a super broad differential in adults and pediatrics as well. Some of the things to highlight that they, they kind of hit on, infection is always a concern. So if there's a fever, signs of nuchal rigidity, headache, things like that, thinking about meningitis. Of course, they talked about ingestions. That is a huge concern. I mean, especially in the toddler age group, that sort of 18 month old, the three to five year old age group, where you've got early mobility, getting into things that aren't great for you. Um, so overdose is big. Seizures, where if a child has a seizure and then comes in in what we call a post-ictal state or this period of being very sleepy following a seizure, uh, somewhat common. And then trauma is another big one. You gotta make sure this kid didn't hit their head and they have a new head bleed or cerebral edema or something like that. No signs of infection. We're gonna start with blood and urine tests. Check for any metabolic abnormalities. Okay, so overall, I think they did a reasonable job getting a differential diagnosis going and sending some labs. The thing I'll fault them for is in the emergency department or in the ICU, I always say you really have two jobs. Like the first job, figure out what's going on so that we can treat it. And that's what they're doing really well. The second job though is support the patient while you're figuring things out. So for a kid who comes in who's really obtunded or really sleepy and not responding to verbal stimulus or asking him to wake up, the next thing you really need to do is provide what's called a noxious stimulus or you need to cause pain to see if the patient wakes up with that. In this case, you could do what's called a sternal rub or you could take a pen or your fingers and squeeze a fingertip really hard to cause pain and see if the patient wakes up. This is really important and is gonna determine your management. There's actually something we call the Glasgow Coma Score or the GCS. And this looks at three different areas. So basically your eye opening, your verbal responsiveness, and then your motor responsiveness. And it judges it on a score. And there's a saying, if the GCS is less than eight, you should intubate. And it's basically saying, if somebody is super passed out or really comatose, they are actually a danger to themselves or they will choke on their own secretions or aspirate leading to a pneumonia. And so you want to put a breathing tube in to protect them and breathe for them. So they kind of skipped that, which was a mistake in my mind, but all the other stuff looked pretty good. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Langdon. Almost all of our labs are back on Sleeping Boy Tyler. All 100% normal. Hmm. What are we missing? Nothing comes back that normal. Is he waking up? No, he's, he's, he's still fast asleep. Most of the lab results are in and they look great. No abnormal blood count, no uh, electrolyte abnormalities, count, so no like diabetes, no um, kidney no disease. No acidosis, so. kidney injury, Good. they're so, saying. So what's wrong with him? We're still trying to figure that out. Did he have a play date yesterday by chance? No, he had preschool, but he was fine when I picked him up. Any kids in his class still? No, my phone tray would have lit up if someone else was sick. He eat anything this morning? No. So he's something in the mouth. It looks like some sort of gelatin. Hmm. Any chance yeah, he could yeah. have gotten into some uh, bath beads or laundry pods? No, and there's That's no such question. thing in our house. What about gummies? No, we're very strict about candy. Right? It looks like a gummy. Oh, oh yeah. Shit. Got him. Danny. What about Danny? Your brother, he... He gave me some gummies he got in Cleveland. They were in my coat pocket. Oh, yeah. Serious? Pot gummies? Yes. I'm so Let's sorry. See if could definitely cause this lab, altered mental status. Hey, this, this is Dr. Langdon from the ED. Can I fast track a lab on a little boy, last name Jones, first name Tyler, tox screen? Yeah, I'm out. 
I mean it. This is legit, Why don't too. we step you outside know, and maybe you can help me figure out how much drugs take. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to come back, and the yeah, other labs I will come back quicker, quick and so calling to, to check on it would make sense. Labs confirm it. Your son tested positive for cannabis. It's a there it is. Nightmare. All right, so just to say a couple things about marijuana, cannabis, and, and how it relates to pediatrics. So number one, I don't care at all if people use THC or cannabis or marijuana, really not for me to, to say or to judge. But one thing I will say is the way that things have gone with the legalization, and especially with weed gummies, it has created a public health issue for children. So cannabis edible ingestions are up almost 1,400% from 2017 to 2021. A lot of this to me has to do with the fact that the way that people are wrapping gummies or, or advertising gummies are super attractive to little kids. So kids who are like 18 months to three years are the ones who are at biggest risk here, where they have early mobility, they're starting to get into things that they're not supposed to be getting into, and these weed gummy packages look amazing to kids. Like, I mean, they just look like super flashy, super fun. And then when they eat them, yeah, they might have like a little funny THC taste, but a lot of it is going to just be a gummy or fruit flavor that the kid really likes. The presentation they showed here is exactly right. So we say somnolence or being obtunded or just very, very sleepy is probably the primary symptom you're going to see. Um, you'll also see ataxia or kind of a little bit of wobbliness or unsteady gait. You'll have dizziness, some hypotonia or just floppiness of the child. For kids, it's reported like one to 3% will develop coma or be so passed out that they actually have respiratory depression. Like I was talking about before, they're not breathing on their own and end up needing to get intubated or have a breathing tube placed. Seizures have also been reported with THC overdoses, so it would be very relevant in a case like this where being super sleepy like this child is could be what's called a post-ictal state or a period after a seizure where someone is very, very sleepy. In terms of the dose, so really high doses, of course, are going to cause worse effects, but a toxic effect for young kids can be as little as 1.7 milligrams per kilogram. So what does that mean? Well, let's just translate it. The typical three-year-old, let's say, weighs 13 kilograms. So that's like 28 pounds. That would mean that the toxic ingestion for that child is only 22 milligrams. So again, you see these like gummies where each gummy is 10 milligrams. They only have to eat two or three before they've ingested a toxic amount that can cause problems. Most of these kids should be fine as long as you get them to a hospital where they can be taken care of. Putting a breathing tube in and put them on the mechanical ventilator is generally a low risk thing that we can do and keep them safe. And then we can watch for seizures and high and low blood pressures and give medicines to correct those numbers. So a problem that parents often face is if they know their child took too much THC, they often get nervous. They don't wanna bring their child in because they're fearful that CPS will get involved and then they'll take their kid away from them. And I get that. And to be honest, medical providers are mandated reporters. So it is possible and likely even that CPS will be involved. But what I'll say is two things. Number one, if your child could die at home, you need to bring them in no matter what to keep them safe. And number two, if it's an honest mistake or a one-time thing, what CPS often wants to see is that parents responded in a way that put their child first. They wanna see that as soon as they found out something happened, they brought the kid in because that's what's best for them. And then just remember at home, out of reach is not enough. So using a double barrier where if you have THC gummies, number one, that they are hidden, that the kids don't know where they are. And number two, that they are locked. You need both of those things to be true. So the kid doesn't even know where to look and then can't get into it even if they find it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please give a like, subscribe or a comment below and I'll see you on the next one.